um, really, uh, you know, break it down and study because you're not going to get everything today. The Holy Spirit is going to continue to reveal some things to you as we go. Hallelujah. As we go. All right. Praise God. In the scriptures, in fact, you, I would like for you to go ahead and turn uh, to Nehemiah chapter 8. And we're going to, that's the first passage of scripture. Nehemiah chapter 8. You can look at 5 through 6. Uh, you have it in your notes. So you can, I don't, you know, really need to repeat that, but it's in your notes and uh, and uh, you can you can refer um, for all the scriptures that we're going to cover today. The Lord gave me a word uh, this morning, actually last night, that that the church uh, is at a critical moment in our in our lives. We are at a critical moment. And I'm not just talking about the local church because God has kind of, I believe, disrupted all of church as usual. Uh, God obviously wanted us out here in the earth, out here in the world, out here in the community, um, reaching people because he's thrust us out of the building. And apparently it doesn't seem like it's getting any better uh, and we we must stay safe and protected uh, from the coronavirus. So God has thrust us out in the world and into the community. It's a critical moment. Um, and as I was preparing this message, I began to think about what is important. Uh, and I based that up on what will be important in heaven. Uh, we have a taste of eternity inside of us. And I got to thinking, I said, all this other stuff that we portray as being important are necessary will not show up in heaven. And I start thinking about what, what are the things that the church, that we can teach the church, um, that will help them not only now, but also the life to come. Because some stuff just doesn't matter. And we put so much of our time and emphasis on stuff that is not eternal. And I thought about what will last not only here, but there in eternity. And number one thing that came to my mind is worship. The number one thing that came to my mind is worship. And I thought, can that apply to us right now as we go through this, the things that we're going through? There are such, um, so, so, so many things taking place in society today that is creating so much anxiety. Um, you know, the economy, our jobs, finances, relationships, um, having to stay home, uh, not knowing what tomorrow will bring, our children, not if knowing whether or not you're going to catch the coronavirus, has increased our worry level, our anxiety. And the Bible says be anxious for nothing. We know what that is because when we do, we, when, we, when we worry, we're being anxious. Um, and that has increased in the earth. Not you think, amen, we as Christians are challenged with everyday life. Um, just imagine a person that does not know God, who doesn't have a personal relationship with him, who is carrying the load all by themselves. Just imagine that person not even knowing God, not even having the the luxury of prayer and the luxury of worship and the luxury of being in fellowship with other believers, the, the load that's on them. And I thought, my God, my God, there's so much anxiety. People are casting off restraint. People are having heart attacks. People are worrying. There are people dying all around us. This is an unprecedented time and season. 
but it's also an opportunity uh, for us as the church to move into a place where we can, we can probably move the needle, the heavenly needle greater at this time than any other time. And it's, and you know what? I, I found out that the, the way we move right now in this season will make an, a, heaven, a heavenly and an eternal impact. And so we got to line ourselves up with the things that really matter. And I'm going to tell you, heaven, in heaven, worship lives. The angels worship him. Amen. Not only um, worship lives, but also the word will last. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Uh, and, and what we do for Christ right now is the stuff that will last. You know, God doesn't care about your, amen, your, your new barbecue pit that you, you, you need to have. God is not that much concerned about the, the armor all on your tires. He's not that excited about your new house. Uh, he's not that concerned about all your materialistic stuff. At this point, we need to be, it's nice having those things. We have those things, but it, it, it ain't about this. I start getting down to the bare bone of what's important. And the only thing that's going to be the antidote to worry is your worship. And I know it seems like a very simple title, but I want to kill some, some stereotypes and some, some sacred cows when it comes to true worship. Because many of us um, have learned a religious way to worship God. And, and there, there, there seem to be not a lot of substance uh, to our worship. And so today we want to, amen, win at worship because, amen, when you worship, you are in. Anytime you do true worship, you're going to be in some warfare. And the enemy is not going to like it, but you're going to advance your life greater when you worship God and know how to worship him and have some substance in your worship as well as intelligence in your worship. Amen. God does not want us to worship and be absent and our brain be absent. God wants us to know who we worship. Jesus said, you don't know who you worship, but I know who I worship. Amen. And so it's important for us to know who we worship, how to worship. Amen. Because it's not a worship is not just at 11 o'clock a.m. Worship is not just, amen, a, a, a uh, emotional experience. In fact, it's, it's more than just an emotional experience. And so I want to make sure we dive into it real quickly and jump into what worship is all about. And I just, I pray that you will win at worship and um, know what you, the, your worship uh, is your worship. As you can ask yourself, is your worship, is, is it based upon uh, Christ? Is your worship based upon the word? What kind of worship do you have? Or do you worship at all? Or do you know how to worship? Or you don't know how to worship? Amen. Amen. Some people don't even know how to worship, but have we have a relationship with the Lord. I want to teach you today how to worship and how to win at worship. But before we go into it, I got some questions I want to ask you. Is your worship emotional based or word based? Is your worship emotional based or word based? You know, uh, I'm African American, obviously, and and um, I come from a very emotional um, culture and people, and and we uh, we know how to have some emotional church. We know how to uh, cry out unto the Lord and and uh, and really, really uh, become emotional. And uh, oftentimes, uh, with the church I came from in the past. You know, we would we would uh, when we really have a high time in in worship and high time in service, 
amen, we'll come out of that service, man, glowing like me. And we just feel like we were glowing. Uh, and then somebody would ask us, amen, how was service today? And we'll say, it was awesome. It was great, man. It was, man, it was powerful. It was live. It was lit. And we'll say stuff like that. I don't know if I said lit, but it was, because it was a while ago. Uh -huh. and, uh, and people say, well, what, what was the word about? What, what was the service about? And, I, and, and, and many of us would say, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It was just good. It was just good. It felt good. And we were so into our emotions that we didn't even, we even, we, we didn't even get any word. We didn't even, the preacher hooped and he hollered and amen. And, 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 and the, we sung the songs over and over again, but we did not retain anything in our worship. Now, that may not be most of you on here, but I'm going to tell you, if your, your worship includes your emotion, but it does not exclude your mind, it does not exclude every part of your, your being. And that's why it's important to know who you worship and how to worship. Amen. It must be more than just, uh, it, it must be more than just, um, you know, um, um, emotional based. It has to have some intelligence to it. You need to know when you worship, why you do what you do. Uh, you, it's important to, to, when you worship, to be engaged and your mind be engaged and your soul, your whole soul need to be worshiping God. Your emotions, your will, your mind, amen, must be involved in your worship because my God, let me tell you, when you can do more in your worship then you can at work. You can change the atmosphere. And we're going to show you in the word right here how much the worship can do for in a very, in, very tangible way in your life. Amen. You, you, you might start seeing your bank account turn around if you worship God right. Amen. Is your worship, number two question is, is your worship Christ-centered or self or need-centered? Amen. Is it Christ-centered or self or need? That's probably why some folk don't feel like worship, worshiping because it's been so based upon emotions and, and needs. When you don't need anything, you don't feel a need to worship. Amen. It never should be self-centered, all about me, all about, all about me. It, it never should be about, it should be all about God. And so if we in our, in our worship, focusing on self, if we're focusing on our needs and focusing on what I'm going through, you're having a pity party. You're not having worship. A lot of stuff that we've called worship is not worship. A lot of stuff that we call praise is not praise. And so if we are basing it up on, you know, getting emotional, I'm not saying it does not include emotions, but it does not exclude your brain either. Come on, somebody. So it's important that we understand that worship requires us to be Christ-centered. Think about his goodness and all that he's done for you. It needs to be God-centered. Think about your relationship with the Lord. Think about what he's done for you. Think about what he's brought you out of. Think about uh, what he's going to take you through. Think about how he's protecting you. Think about, you know, the attitude of gratitude is, is, is a part of worship. But moaning and groaning and begging and, and, and scratching and, 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 and hoping that God will feel sorry for you is, is not worship. It's not worship. So, so it's important that we know who we worship, whom you know, you know, we, we got to understand that we worship out of relationship. Not everybody can worship him. Everybody can praise him, but not everybody can worship him. You, oh, you, what do you mean, everybody? Listen, uh, all creation is called to praise him. Let everything that had breath praise the Lord. But everything that has breath cannot worship him because worship happens out of an intimate relationship with God. And if we have not built an intimate relationship with God, by getting into his word, if we're not studying his word every day, eating his word, we don't know the mind of God. We don't know the heart of God. 
And how can we have a heart-to-heart -heart worship with God if we don't know his word? And if we don't know his word, when we are speaking words of adoration, how do we know if we're offending him or we are we blessing him? Because it's not about us, it's about him in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you another question. Um, do, do, do your worship, uh, do your worship, um, uh, do you worship from your heart, from your head or from your heart? Now, I just mentioned that it's important to engage your mind, but that's not the only place that you stay in your mind. You have, as the spirit of God illuminates your mind, as the spirit of God moves within your life, what happens is we go into, amen, into our heart and we start feeling God from an intimate, not just, not just an emotional, but an intimate. There's a difference between being intimate with someone and being emotional with them, amen. And so it's important that our worship is not just from our, from our head, but our worship is from our heart. Amen. And, I, and, and, and then, then uh, do, you, do you know, uh, are you worshiping to be seen or to surrender your life? That's supposed to be your life to God. Are you worshiping to be seen or to surrender? Now, here it is. A lot of times, there are people is love live worship of being coming person because you know not right now over the computer nobody can see you jumping up and acting a fool, amen. There's nothing wrong with jumping up and acting a fool for Jesus as long as you know why you jumping up and acting a fool for Jesus and you're not your motive is not for somebody to see you, amen. Jesus said I'm tired of all this showboating in church and then you come out and be something else. I'm preaching better than you saying amen or giving me a heart. I know you don't. I, listen, listen, I'm telling you that God is saying, hey, listen, I'm sick of, you know, outward show. Amen. Do we worship from, from, our, from people that want to see us or do we worship because we're surrendered in our closet with God and it's just a personal thing that we're just worshiping him? We don't care who's looking at us. Amen. We don't care if our friend looking at us or our enemy a folk who like us or don't like us. I'm worshiping my God and I'm going to worship him whether you like it or not. Come on, somebody. And if I look a little funny to you when I worship him, because worship is not just in the service. That don't keep, don't, don't, don't. It's not just in the context of the service, but while we in the context of the service and I'm worshiping you, I, I, I'm not that much concerned about what you think about me because you don't know what me and my God has been through. Hallelujah. So I'm going to worship him heart to heart, spirit to spirit, mind to mind, soul to soul. Hallelujah. Do you know that when you worship, uh, you know, do, uh, do you know that when you worship is a weapon? Worship, I forgot to put it in. Worship, I'm sorry, y'all. Worship is a weapon of warfare. So if you are worshiping, you have just enlisted yourself. Come on, people of God. You have just enlisted yourself into God's army. And you are now saying, devil, uh, it's me against you. So when you go into worship, you got to put your full armor on. And when you go into worship, you got to go into it to win. Amen. It is a fight. It's a fight to even want to get up and pray and see God's face and fast and go after God. Yes, it's a chore, but my God know that you're in it to win it. Amen. And if you're in it to win it, hallelujah, you will win, but you got to be strategic and you have to be, uh, you have to position yourself to win in worship. Something as minor as worship is so very important because you know what? We don't have to worry. We can just worship. We don't have to be concerned about the cares of the world. We can just worship. Amen. So, so, so I'm going to give you, uh, I will call these, amen, three, three uh, perspectives on worship. I'm going to give you three perspectives on worship. 
You need to take notes on this. Well, we got notes right here. Just print them out. Um, three perspectives on worship. Mm -hmm. Three, three. Let me give you three perspectives on worship. Number one, e uh, elevating the word in your worship. And that's why I take us to our very first uh, passage of scripture here. We need to elevate the word in our worship. Elevate the word. It says, and he says here, and Ezra opened the book. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. This was not a personal worship. This was a public worship. And Ezra, who's a worshiper, opened the book inside of me. And it says, for he was standing above all the people. So we can see that the word now is on a platform with Ezra speaking the word. And that was an elevation of the word. If we don't elevate the word in our worship, come on. Now, I know he was there in a, in a very physical way, but I'm given revelation here that, that he was not just physically elevated above all the people. It was because the word itself was displayed and elevated on a platform all by itself. And so when you worship God, I'm not just talking about the preach word. I'm talking about the word that you place in your worship. So when you're talking to God, you spitting back his word to him. You declaring, you preaching, you declaring the word of God back to him. You got to know the word to declare the word back to him. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so, 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 so for, for he was standing above all the people and when he opened it, that's why we got platforms today. You know, we got elevation of platforms and we open the word. And there are some, some traditions that came right from this passage of scripture. So number one, we know that, man, you got to elevate the word. But in the word, as you elevate it, uh, he was standing. He was standing. That's why we, you're going to find out in the scripture that, that when we open the word and we start declaring the word and we reading out the word, we have everybody to stand. We have everybody to stand in honor of the word and on, in honor of worship, Right? For he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. That's how much they honored the Torah. They didn't even have the full Bible that we have today. They had the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and they respected the word so much that as, as Ezra was declaring the word out to them, they stood up in honor. Like, like when you go into a courtroom and, 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 and then the person says, all rise, because the judge walks in the place. Amen. If we can do that for man, we ought to be able to do that for the word. But not only just stand up physically, but stand up for the word. Stand up as we speak the word and elevate the word in our worship. I hope you got that revelation. Praise God. Then all the people answered, amen, amen. That's why I say I'm a dialectical preacher. I like when the people respond to God's word. I love when people say amen, because when you say amen, you're not just giving, you're not just giving me a boost of confidence, which, which I appreciate that. It's not for me. The amen is not for my word. The amen is for the word itself. The amen is not because the word came from me and you want to encourage me. The word you saying amen to the word that is given and you saying, so be it in my life. That's one of the ways you can actualize the word. Once the word is spoken and elevated in the atmosphere, then you can grab hold of the word and bring it into your life by saying amen. And since we are doing digital fingerprints right now on the computer, one of the ways that you actualize the word is you type amen or you Amen. You hit the uh, heart button or something to to actualize the word in your life. So if you, Amen. If you're a person that wants to elevate the word, if you're a person that believes and agree that the word, Amen, should be part of your worship, then give him all the praise and give him all the glory and say, "I, Amen, Ezra, Amen." While lifting up their hands, here's another part of worship. Not only do you amen, begin to stand and honor the word. Not only do you uh, give God uh, praise 
for the word. Mm, glory be to God. Not only did, did the people say amen to the word, amen, the Bible says while lifting their hand, they were so honored by the worship of the, uh, of the word and the word bringing uh, elevation in their worship, they lifted up their hands. They lifted up their hands. Come on, some of you are shy about lifting up your hands. It's in the word that we should lift up our hands. But we need to know what we're doing when we're lifting our hands and worshiping God. So when you're lifting your hands, you're saying, God, everything in me is submitted to everything in you. Hallelujah. You saying when you lift your hands, you said, I surrender, God. And you also saying, I, I, I need you, Jesus. You, when you lifting up your hands, I'm telling you what you're doing in a very symbol, symbolic way. You are putting on notice the devil that you're worshiping your God. Hallelujah. You're putting on notice everybody around you that you love him. You're putting on notice for everybody to believe that God is God and there is none other. You are literally uplifting the word of God when you're speaking out and declaring and people saying, amen, praise God. They're lifting their hands. And then you come out of a, amen, out of a lifting of the hand as a, almost like a touchdown, amen, a celebration. You go down, amen, in worship and you go down and you bow down as you surrendered everything to them. And the scripture says, and they bowed their heads and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. They bow their heads and they worship the Lord, their faces to the ground. You know why they did that? It, it, after, after, after the word being so powerful and elevated, they bow their head, they said, listen, it's not about me. I don't wanna look around. All I want is the vision of Jesus and I'm getting down and I'm surrendering unto God. Amen. And I'm letting him know that he's king of kings and Lord. He's royal and he's everything. Hallelujah. Listen, you don't need to worry. Just worship. You don't need to worry. Just worship. Number two, I'm going to jump to number two. Amen. Are y'all getting anything out of this so far? Amen. I hope you are because I think that's a lost uh, weapon that we have, the weapon of worship. Amen. We, we, we don't even show up on time for the worship time. Come on, somebody. somebody. Worship, I mean, you just, I just come and get the word. I just, I just want to get the word, you know. Uh, I, I, you know I, don't, I don't like the music that they play because the music they play is not my kind of music. It ain't about your kind of music. It's about showing up with everybody else and standing up and giving God some praise and, 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 and honoring God, amen, through your digital, amen, through your digital worship, amen. And give God some praise and showing up on time and honoring him and honoring the word, praise God. Hallelujah. Honoring the worship, honoring uh, your, your fellow brothers and sisters. It ain't about whether you like it or not. Hey, man, I can learn to love anything. Come on, I can learn to love anything if I got enough exposure and if I see the stuff that I need to see God showing me, I can worship in a Catholic church. Come on, I can give God praise in a dead Baptist church. Oh, any kind of church. I'm telling you because my worship is not about my surroundings. My worship is not about the music. My worship is not about, come on, uh, if I feel like doing it, my worship is in my honor to the word and my honor to God and my honor to Jesus Christ and my honor to the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me slow it down for just a minute. Number two, evangelizing by the witness. How many know that we can actually witness through our worship? This is what the world needs right now. The world is down, depressed. They don't, they don't know what to do. They don't know who to turn to. What if Christians understood that your radical, your unhindered, your unashamed worship can become a witness to the laws. Mm. The Bible says, uh, be ready to give an answer of the hope that's inside of you. Folk has no hope. They don't have no hope. But when you worship God, they like, what, who are you worshiping? Who you, I want to, who is that? Why are you crying out like that? Why you got your hands living? Why are you speaking out like that? <clears throat> Even though you're not doing it to be seen by men, 
even though you're not doing it to, to be recognized, you have, you, you, it's Christ-centered. It's not need-centered or self-centered. You worship him because you love him. But when you do that, amen, it becomes a showcase where folk can um, start asking about the hope that's inside of you. But if we're ashamed and we don't know how to properly worship, we're going to put the wrong message out there. Amen. Amen. So here's a scripture here in Acts chapter 18, verse 7 through 8. It says, and he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice. Justice means one who worshiped God. Ooh, I wish I was, my name was one who worshiped God. I mean, Justice. Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house, watch this, was next door to the synagogue. The synagogue was the Jewish church uh, at that time. And his house was right next door to it. And then, then Crispus, right, the ruler of the synagogue. Here is the priest and the ruler of the synagogue that was right next door. Come on, follow me. Right next door to Justice House. Who's a worshiper? Now, it, it's, it, now the, he was a worshiper. He was in his house. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. Wait a minute. My God, justice must have been worshiping. <clears throat> he must have been peeping into his, his window and watching him worship. He must have been looking, uh, hearing a loud voice go off. As he worked, he was in a synagogue in a place that obviously he was not even saved. And he was the ruler of the synagogue, but he believed on the Lord with all his house, not only him, his wife and children all start believing because they were in proximity. Hear what I'm saying. They were in proximity of worship. And it was a word-based, Christ-centered worship, obviously. Hmm. And as he worshiped, and many of the Corinthians hearing, just hearing, they didn't even see, hearing. I bet his worship was so loud, they were hearing his worship, believed and worshiped and were baptized. Your, your, your worship can, he, can be a witness and evangelize folk, amen. You literally can be doing, glory be to God, can be doing the work of an evangelist as you worship, as you worship your God in a very radical way, understanding who you worship, understanding, speaking God's word in your worship, declaring scriptures in your worship. Hmm, glory be to God. Worship is evangelistic. Come on, somebody. Everybody can worship God. Therefore, everybody can be an evangelist. Hallelujah. You can, you can evangelize. And here's a dude that was in the ruler of the synagogue, one of the leaders of the synagogue, the Jewish church at that time, which was next door in proximity of a worshiper. Come on. Anybody that comes in proximity with you, if you worship this way and don't worry and just worship, amen, when they see you going through and you just worship, they see, amen, that some of your loved ones died, but you still just worship. Come on. They see that you are going to work every day. Amen. And, and sometimes you're not, you don't feel well, but you just worship. Come on. What happens is you become a witness. You become a witness to the loss. You said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Here it is, right there. This is the part of that 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, that if we seek his face, if we seek his face, come on, part of seeking his face is worshiping him. That's part of that criteria of God turning it all around. And I, I just believe that God wants us to worship him. And last but not least, amen, I hope I ain't keeping you too long. I hope you're getting something out of this uh, because I certainly did. And it, 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 just, it just, it moves me, it reminded me of what I need to do. My wife and I are going to be 
uh, be going on some fast. That's an act of worship. We're going to be fasting. Amen. Uh, and uh, with, 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 uh, and if we can get that information, we'll get that information to you. But we're fasting with uh, uh, Brother Afakai. My wife always talks about him. He's a, God uses him in very many miracles and signs and wonders. And he's, he's taken a whole week, the first seven days of July, to just fast. And we're going to go into a fast and encourage you to do the same thing, whatever fast God put on your heart. But uh, we're going to do a fast and we're going to worship and we're going to pray. Amen. Uh, and with them and, and be a part of them because we got some, amen, some things that, that we want, amen, our worship and our time with the Lord to, amen, literally change everything around us. Amen. There, we're getting ready to go into a, a deep season uh, that we need to be fortified by worship. We need to be fortified by our praising God and elevating God. Amen. There he is. Prophet just put his name. Uh, we're going to get some details on how you can also join in in the in the in the in the prayer time and be with uh, this miracle working uh, gifted brother of the Lord, Amen. That's doing all kinds of stuff, man. He he's got the word of knowledge, the gifts of the spirit. Worship also would create an atmosphere for the gifts of the spirit. Reason why we don't see miracles, signs, and wonders. The reason why it seems like that's a thing of the past. It's because we don't truly worship God the way he wants to be worshipped. You know, uh, worship is an intimate time, and, and you got to be very strategic, and you got to have some intelligence. It's like romancing God. It's when you romance, amen, uh, your wife or your, just, just, your, just your wife and you're romancing her, amen, she wants to know that you put some thought into it. And we all can get better at that, including me. But she wants to know that you thought about this process. She wants to know you're not just doing something spontaneous to get something out of her. She wants to know that you thought about it. So that having the word in part of your worship and intelligence in part of your worship causes it to be even more intimate. Amen. Number three, it says empowered by the word of worship. Um, excuse me, we need to be empowered by the women of worship. Now, now, uh, you know, I'm gonna tell you something, men uh, and women, let me, let me tell you something. I believe God has chosen women to have leverage in this area. Not that, because all the people I talk about were, were, were men, but I believe that God has, has given women a, an edge, a, a gifting, a special anointing when it comes to worship. Uh, I'm thinking about, uh, uh, you know, Ma, uh, Mary who worshiped Jesus in, an, in, a, in a very radical way. Amen. I, I, you've heard me make this statement that there are three parts to Christianity. And one is work, the other one is fellowship, and the other one is worship. And, and you know, Martha, Lazarus, and Mary, um, you know, sim they symbolized that in their, in their actions when Jesus showed up at their house. Uh, and, and, and Martha got, she was a busy, busy, probably like me, I'm a busy, busy kind of person, and just want to work for Jesus, right? And, there, and there's, there's a time to work. There's a time to work. There's time to do the work. Amen. Some of you are like that too. You, you know, you, you just like to work. You like to get involved working and, 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 and see God do things. But then there's a time when you need a fellowship. And, and, and your work should, should you, know, you know, we need a fellowship like Lazarus. So, so Martha worked for Jesus and, 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 and began to serve Jesus at the table. We know that uh, 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 Lazarus was fellowshipping with Jesus on the table. Uh, there was there was uh, a fellowship. We need to, Amen. We need to fellowship with each other. But Mary was at a posture of worshiping Jesus under the table. Come on, somebody under the table. She was worshiping him, and so so it's important that we worship God under the table. Amen, which means no agenda. You ain't got no agenda. 
You're not trying to impress him with, with your work. You're not trying to, uh, you know, you know, get in good with him, uh, with your, with your fellowship. You just under the table don't need to be seen by nobody like Mary worshiping him with no agenda under the table. In fact, like another Mary, she broke the alabaster box and her whole year's worth of salary with the oil. She, she said, I'm going to give you back everything I worked for, everything I was fellowship. I'm giving it all back to you in my worship. That is the posture of worship. And women have a way to not be so concerned about money, concerned about people, and they just go, they go right on in. And here's an example of that right here in this passage of scripture in Acts chapter 16, 13 through 15. Amen. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside. Now, this is Apostle Paul and Silas. And where prayer, watch this, where prayer, we went out to church, it's time to do church outside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Paul consulted with the women who are already in <clears throat> worshiping God at the riverside. She, she, she was, okay, and then, and then it goes, now a certain woman named Lydia, who was a worshiper, heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. Come on. Hmm. She was a worshiper. And, 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 and the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. <clears throat> and when she had heard she and her household was baptized. She begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. And worship, women have a way to, amen, to, to persuade God. They have a way to, to, get, to get to God. They came from the umbrella of a, of, of a, of a, of a synagogue, they went out at the river and began to worship and then wail before God. Come on. You got to wail. You got to get out of being anything that can, can hinder you. And you got to get out and you got to get to a place and learn from the women and worship and worship. Lydia was a worship. Purple is, is a symbol of royalty. She had a royal worship. Amen. That it was so persuasive. Amen. And she probably sewn into uh, Apostle Paul's the ministry uh, and, and, and began to, to bless him. And, and this, this led to, this taught Paul and them. Amen. This actually was, uh, they were consulting with her and those women who were willing in worship. And I really believe Paul caught on to worship here. I believe Paul was on fire in worship because what happened right after that, let me prove it. Amen. What happened right after that, Apostle Paul was uh, falsely, uh, because, because there was a, another woman that came and began to praise, and, and, uh, and she was a, 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 a fortune teller, and, and, they, and, and she was right, amen, that these are men of God and that will come to his service and do it every day, every day, and, and to the point where Paul got sick of it, and the gift of word of knowledge, and, and casting out demons, cast that demon out of her, even though <clears throat> that woman was a fortune teller, and he cast that demon out of it. And then um, the men of that, of that place got upset because this woman was making some money for them. And had, um, long story short, <clears throat> had Apostle Paul and Silas uh, arrested because they, they, they intervened by healing this woman or asking out the demon where this woman could not be a fortune teller anymore. And the power of, 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 ca of casting that demon out because they just came from a worship service. They just came from a time of being taught how to worship. And that, that worship, uh, uh, weapon of worship got them incarcerated. But my God, the same thing <clears throat> that can get you locked up. <clears throat> Glory be to God, I'm gonna slow down. Hold on, hold on. The same thing that can get you locked up can get you set free, amen. Your, your worship got you locked up. 
The power that came from that worship to cast out demons got you locked up because you were messing with somebody's money. Go ahead and read the rest of the text of that. But, 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 amen, you, you thought, wait a minute, I just learned from these women how to worship. And Paul and Silas start worshiping in that prison place and folk were hearing them. You got to go read it. And I'm going to jump into that probably next week. And as, as, as they were worshiping God, as they were praising God and honoring God and blessing God, hallelujah, amen, we saw God move and shook the place until the jail cells were open. And it brought them out, long story short. I'll dive into that next week, but I'm telling you, worship has a tangible effect. And I want to teach you by next week. <clears throat> I want to teach you next week on how to make your worship tangible, how to get so into your worship that is so tangible that it start manifesting, it start changing your bank account. It starts changing your relationship. It starts changing you. It starts heal. You start getting healed under the power of worship. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want you to know that God loves you. And God honors you. And I'm not going to be here much longer. I got about eight more minutes. But I'm telling you, we ought to worship God. We need to worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. And as we play, we play this song here, I want you to understand that worship is it's not just about mu music stirring us up or going to church and all of that. It's more than that. I want you and to become an authentic worshiper. I would like to even go in the community and set up worship, uh, like you have those drive uh, drive-in um, worship services. And I would love to do this in my, my complex here, in, in our in our uh, subdivision here. Play up, put a big balloon up and let people bring their lawn chairs out. And let us just play worship music and, and pray for the people and anoint them. I want y'all to be praying after we get off that fast. We're going to be planning and praying that we can put up a big, big, big uh, screen, a balloon screen. Put some speakers out there and let, let the worship be released. Because we know that worship can bring about a witness. Worship can help us elevate the word. Worship, if you're worshiping with the right people, if they're in proximity with you, worship can draw them into you. Worship can set the captives free. Get you out of prison. Come on. Worship is everything we need. In fact, I'm making a commitment. I want to get a committee of you that if you want to be on that team, we're going to put something together where we can, on a Friday night, glory be to God, put up a big screen right here on the big tennis court and, and invite people out, cook some food or something, and get them out with hot dogs. It's not a movie. It's a worship time. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. There's nothing like the presence of God. Lord, I thank you, Lord. Everyone that's under the sound of my voice, I pray in Jesus' name that if there's anyone that does not know you, they can only praise you. They can't worship you. But if they come to know you, they can worship like everybody else. Father, I pray that we will renew our worship. We will refocus on our worship. We'll get our ear pods out and get our music out and worship you. We will, Lord God, get the word out again and worship. We will get consecrated and get worship because we'll start seeing things as we have a worship mega movement. I want to see, Lord God, us set up worship places. And even at times we can set up the same tent and restaurants and and have a drive in worship. People can drive their cars and still worship God. And, and, and we can see, just go and pray for them, and not just preach to them, but pray for them and minister to them and let them hear what we hear. Let them see what we see. Lord God, I declare and decree that the best is yet to come. 
We love you, Jesus, and we bless you. I pray for all the Source Church family. But keep them, protect them, and watch over them. Let worship happen in their home, Lord God. Let them worship and turn their houses, a house of prayer, to also a house of worship. Let them elevate their music and worship and let it go down and go through the elements of the house. Oh God, we thank you, Lord God. Let us take this weapon of worship and win souls for you. In Jesus' name.